Good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, the uh, Emerging Markets uh, Insight Series that is organized uh, regularly between the uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology's uh, Institute of Emerging Market Studies and of course with our partner uh, and donor uh, EY. Uh, we're very pleased today to have a very topical uh, and contemporarily uh, interesting subject that we will be exploring over the next hour and a half. Uh, it, will global value chains uh, survive uh, COVID-19? And we've lined up uh, three exciting speakers. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome all of you to this webinar. Uh, one of the good things about uh, doing it through web webinars is that we reach out to audiences uh, uh, outside of Hong Kong as well. So to that, today's subject, uh, we're going to explore uh, global value chains. And in many ways, the death of global value chains uh, has been foretold previously. Uh, it was predicted after the September 11 attacks in 2001, uh, the SARS uh, epidemic in 2002. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was a lots of debate about offshoring uh, and outsourcing. And then of course, after the global financial crisis of 2008, uh, growth in global trade uh, has lagged uh, growth in global GDP. And of course, last year, we had the trade wars between Donald Trump's US and Xi Jinping's China. All of these uh, events inflicted some damage on global trade. But even though the expansion of supply chains uh, may have slowed after these events, they have not gone into reverse uh, until this year. Right? They have not stopped. They have not gone into the reverse. But until this year, and, and, and so the real question, I think, uh, arising from the pandemic is will the damage to global supply chains, global value chains, be a temporary one as uh, it was in previous crises? Or will there be more long lasting impacts uh, on the viability, uh, on the resilience of uh, global supply chains? And also more broadly on the future of globalization. So without further ado, I will invite our three panelists uh, to give us their opening remarks and, and their thoughts on the on this big question. Uh, I'm very pleased to first welcome uh, Professor Edwin Lai uh, to, to, to speak to us. He's a professor of economics at HKUSD. He's been a professor here since July two, 2009 and subsequently was appointed director of the Center for Economic Development. Uh, welcome, Edwin, and over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Donald. Um, Okay, so uh, without uh, further ado, let me just uh, start right away. Uh, so my purpose uh, today is to uh, give you uh, some uh, a, a very brief historical overview of uh, global value chain. And then I would uh, talk about uh, how global value chain actually helps uh, developing countries uh, in, to, to get involved in uh, uh, manufacturing and industrialization. And I uh, express my worry about uh, the uh, protectionist uh, sentiment in the developed countries, such as the US. Uh, it might actually threaten uh, further um, development of the global value chain and therefore might actually um, affect the prospects of the future industrialization of developing countries. Uh, but then I also want to talk a little bit about the uh, how the China-U.S. trade conflict uh, had uh, affect uh, China's exports to the U.S. and also China, um, and also um, how um, perhaps the, the the chain, the supply chain, might have actually moved from China uh, to the U.S. Uh, part of it may may have been moved to uh, some substitute countries uh, and. Uh, uh, got exported to the U.S. in an indirect way from China, actually, <laughs> in an indirect way. And then we also talk a little bit about the, the deficit, the trade deficit. Uh, okay, so let me just quickly uh, talk about this. So you all know what is a uh, global value chain, so I don't have to uh, tell you what it is. So, um, for example, iPhone is a very good example of, uh, of, how, of a global value chain in action. So you can see that, let's say, uh, a $2 billion uh, worth of iPhone export from US from China to the US, in fact, only 4% of, of the value added is attributed to China. The others are actually uh, from other countries. So China actually import a lot of intermediate goods from other countries and then assemble the iPhone 
uh, in China and then export to the U.S. So China's value-added exports to the U.S. Uh, out of these two billion dollars is only four percent. So, so we use this concept called the the uh, um, there is a concept called the domestic value-added ratio. Okay, if this ratio is small, that means that only a small fraction of the gross export is actually attributed to the exporter of the final good. Uh, and if this number is smaller, DVAR is smaller, that means that the, uh, the, uh, the global value chain is more entrenched, in other words, okay? Um, so you can see that historically, uh, there is one uh, watershed in developing country uh, industrialization, which is the year 19, around 1980. You can see a sharp increase in developing country exports. And where does it come from? I would imagine that that is because of, mainly because of China. So uh, China um, uh, began uh, to export manufacturing goods uh, and a lot of uh, initially, uh, just a lot of processing trade from China, which is uh, actually uh, related to what I just said about this uh, global value chain kind of uh, export. So, um, um, so China will use uh, mostly important intermediate inputs and then domestic labor to produce the final good and then export the final good to the rest of the world. Okay, so, um, so another way to characterize global value chain is fragmentation. Uh, fragmentation is nothing more than, you know, the you know different stages of production of uh, of a good are actually located in different countries instead of locating in one single country, okay? So uh, that actually is another way of characterizing a global value chain, okay? So you have, you have different, you have upstream uh, and then, you know, going uh, down and down to the last final stage. So here is just uh, to give you some idea about, uh, so this is a, um, I suppose uh, here we're talking about uh, the, um, sure. for China, actually this is China. So this is China, so uh, China's gross export. So out of uh, all the gross export of China, 35% uh, is electrical and op optical equipment, and 35% are other manufacturing. However, if you look at the value added export of China, only 12% can be attributed to electrical and optical equipment. Why? It is simply because of this fragmentation. It's, it's because most of the, va the value added uh, export of China uh, in electrical and optical equipment only account for 12%, okay? So in other words, the domestic value added ratio of China in this, good, in this uh, sector is actually uh, very low, actually. It's almost certainly less than 50%. Uh, so just to give you some idea, uh, so this is China, but if you look at the world, for example, this is actually the world, uh, it, you see similar pattern. Uh, so even though if you look at gross export from, if you sum up all the exports of the world, all the gross export, 67% are so manufacturing exports. But if you actually just look at value at the export, only 39% are actually manufactured export. A lot of this actually becomes service. Actually, a lot of the, 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 the value at export is actually services because, uh, you know, uh, when a country exports manufactured goods, uh, first of all, it imports uh, a lot of, when, when it imports uh, 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 intermediate goods from foreign countries and then add value to it and then export the final good, the, uh, that actually reduces uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, it reduces the domestic value of the ratio, but also services are, really, are actually necessary uh, to export anything. When you ex export manufacturing goods, you need uh, transportation services, you, you need all the business services, insurance, all sorts of things. So that's why service actually, the value added uh, share of service is much larger than uh, the growth export share. Okay, just to, some idea of, of this uh, kind of thing. So um, 
I just want to say that fragmentation has been, been deepening over time. I actually uh, do not have this chart. I, intend, I intended to show you a chart which shows the domestic value-added ratio of, uh, on average has been declining over time. That means that, you know, as I just said, the, uh, the uh, percentage of, of domestic value, uh, domestic value added as a percentage of gross export is uh, actually growing down uh, over time. So it's that steepening. But as I said, um, I noticed that uh, recent, uh, there's some recent emergence of protectionist sentiment in the developed countries may threaten this fragmentation uh, because uh, like if you listen to people like Donald Trump and he would say, oh, uh, he wants to get the US manufacturing uh, back to the US. Uh, if that's the case that it will destroy or partly damage the, this uh, deepening uh, fragmentation process and it may actually affect the prospects of developing country uh, globalized uh, uh, industrialization, okay? So, um, okay, so let me just, um, so this is my worry about the future of globalization, but I also want to talk about the US-China trade war, uh, trade conflict and how it's affect, first of all, how it affect China's exports. So here is a, uh, let's see, I, I have a, okay, here. Uh, you can see this is China's export, uh, merchandise export, I'm sorry, China's merchandise export to the US. Um, uh, this is from first quarter of 2007 to the first quarter of 2020. Um, this is the first quarter when Donald Trump assumes office. So uh, the first uh, round of trade tariff was imposed uh, around 2008 uh, July. So it's like uh, the end of the second quarter uh, around here, around this time. Uh, you can see that it takes effect in 2009. So if you compare 2009 with 2008, this is quarterly data. So, so the best thing to compare is the uh, compare the quarter. So this is the fourth quarter of 2019, and the fourth quarter of 2018 is here. So it, um, you can see uh, that uh, the uh, what is uh, if you compare these two fourth quarters, China's export to U.S. fell by more than 30 billion dollars. This is just one quarter. So. Uh, in the entire year, 2009, China's export to the U.S., uh, I did not have the hot number. I think it's close to 100 billion. So, so, the U US, uh, so China's export to the U.S. might have fallen by a, about 100 billion uh, from 2008 to 2009. So that's a substantial fall. It's a substantial fall. So in fact, in other words, the uh, trade uh, tariff, the, uh, the um, the, uh, I guess the Donald Trump's policy might have really have an effect on China's exports. Uh, but on the other hand, interestingly, the other countries, uh, these are the, let me see, China's exports to other countries. Uh, for example, if you look at Vietnam, which is interesting, China's export to Vietnam actually increases over time, okay, from, from here to here. Uh, let's don't, don't worry about the first quarter of 2000. 20, because it's already the onset of the uh, pandemic. So the, the latest quarter, let's look at the fourth quarter of 2019. So compare with this, this fourth quarter, with this fourth quarter, you can see that it's just an increase. Okay, so that's a general kind of increase uh, from, uh, of China's export to Vietnam. So uh, you can see that uh, in other countries, uh, for example, Mexico, there's also, uh, China's also, also had, um, you know, more and more exports uh, to a country like Mexico, uh, maybe also Malaysia a little bit. Um, so my, my conclusion uh, from looking at this chart is that China seems to be moving the later stage of production of some goods that were destined to the U.S. to countries such as Vietnam. So in other words, there seems to be a relocation of the uh, supply, the root of the supply chain. So, so that's one thing I, 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 I see, I, I, I observe. And then the other thing I want to say uh, is about China-U.S. trade conflict and its effect on bilateral trade deficit of the U.S. So why am I interested in this? So first of all, you look at the trade balance of the U.S. with the rest of the world. Uh, if, um, 
it, actually this is a negative number, right? So so the more so if it goes down, if it goes downward, that actually means that the the, the trade deficit uh, with the world actually goes goes up, right? So going going down means going up. Um, so here you see that uh, what is interesting is that uh, the, the the trade deficit with the rest of the world, uh, strictly speaking, does not really fall very much. Uh, except the, uh, uh, in the first quarter of 2020, it has fallen, but then in the fourth quarter of 2019, it has not really, really fallen with the rest of the world. So U.S. trade balance with the rest of the world does not really fall very much with, uh, with the trade war with China. And this actually is what we expect. Because according to the economic theory, the total trade deficit of the U.S. would not be affected by its trade tariffs on China. The deficit with, with China, the bilateral deficit with China would narrow uh, because of the tariff, because of, of, of but, but the deficit with other substitute countries would actually increase. That, that's our, what the economic theory will tell us. And it, indeed, uh, it's borne out by the, uh, by the data, if you, if you look at this. Uh, uh, okay, for, with China, indeed, uh, the, uh, if you look at the blue line, uh, it's, it's going up. So that means that the, uh, the deficit, bilateral deficit with China has, has, has narrowed, has narrowed, uh, you know, um, if you actually also include the first quarter of 2020, it has narrowed. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, if you look at the bilateral deficit uh, with uh, some uh, of the U.S., with a group of countries that can substitute for China, actually, it actually kind of, you know, widens the trade deficit. So what are these countries? These countries are, you know, Mexico, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, um, Malaysia, this kind of countries. So uh, if you, in particular, if you look at Mexico, uh, U.S. Uh, trade deficit uh, with Mexico has actually gone up. As I said, if you go, going down means going up uh, because this is negative. Um, it's gone up, right? That's an opposite trend. Uh, as China. Vietnam, a uh, very clear trend. Very clear, clear trend. Vietnam uh, uh, trade deficit with Vietnam has widened. Uh, so uh, Thailand uh, just a little bit, not much, uh, uh, or still widened a little bit. So what I'm trying to say is that um, that the the U.S. total trade deficit with the rest of the world does not really change. It just shifts the deficit from with from, from the deficit with China. Uh, being a, having a large chunk uh, to ship it to you know more deficit with like countries like Vietnam and Mexico. So if you even look at the percentage, if you look at the percentage, it's also uh, you can see that right. So so if I uh, just if I may go 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 back to this one with the China. So China's uh, the bilateral deficit. Okay, the percentage of total trade deficit with the U.S. as has fallen uh, on the right hand scale. Uh, fallen to like four, more than 45 to to like even like you know 30 percent, 45 percent, 30 percent. So in other words, out of the total trade deficit of of the U.S., initially it was uh, China account for 45 percent. Now it account for only 30 percent. So fallen a lot. But with um, on the other hand, with uh, the group of countries that can substitute for China, it actually uh, increases from around like 20 percent to 30 some percent. Uh, for um, yeah, so you, you can see this with Mexico, uh, the percentage has increased. Vietnam very clearly increased. Okay, so uh, that's the second point that I want to make. The last point I want to make is about the uh, effect of uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, sorry, this is nineteen, not ninety one. <laughs> this is nineteen. Uh, so I have I don't have much to say about this COVID nineteen except I just want to show you one figure. This one, this one figure, uh, just to want to show you that the this is what this is the uh, this is the last line. Okay, so I'm I'm almost done now. So my last line is to show you the world's total merchandise exports. So you add up all the exports of all the countries of the world. Then you see that okay, it's increasing, 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 and then when it gets to here, at kind of fall. Uh, well, it is natural for it to fall in the first quarter. But then it pick up, and then that's a drastic drop in the first quarter of 2020, and then to the second quarter, further drop. 
uh, a great a great drop. Okay, so that is the effect of uh, COVID nineteen on world trade. Uh, so basically, this is all my slides. Um, so what I want to say is uh, that uh, I do worry about the future of globalization uh, uh, due to global value chain, uh, and uh, but but then I I also uh, look at the China China's um, uh, uh, I guess I guess there is a shifting of the of the of the global value chain from China uh, through other countries. That is that's destined to the U.S. So, so that is what I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edwin, for that great uh, introductory as well as very uh, insightful presentation. Uh, I'll just leave a question because we don't have time for you to respond to it right away. We'll do it during Q and A. Uh, but one of the thoughts on my mind is, uh, as the world was hit by the pandemic, China was obviously the first to, you know, to to bounce back uh, from the pandemic and. China's exports, as we've seen in the last, uh, I would say, last quarter, has rebounded very strongly. Uh, so we're likely to see a reversion to the pre-2019 uh, picture where China was very, running very large uh, surpluses, uh, current account surpluses. Uh, and also because it's uh, China's uh, services imports, which uh, you know, in 2019 was almost as large uh, in terms of its services uh, surplus, Sorry, services deficit was almost as large as its export surplus. Uh, in 2019, uh, most of that services came from outbound Chinese tourists. And of course, in 2020, uh, Chinese tourists have dried up. Uh, but this export machine has, you know, quick, uh, has wrapped into life much earlier than, than, than other major exporting countries. So I just want to put it out there and, and, and later to tap your views on how you think the world, and especially the US, might respond to a position where China goes back to running very large current account surplus and whether you think this is a, likely to be a sustained phenomenon or whether we are likely to see uh, the, what, what occurred in 2019 being the more sustained state of uh, uh, affairs. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so I'll just put it out there. So um, our next speaker, uh, th thanks again, Edwin. Uh, that was very sharp and, and succinct. Our next speaker is, uh, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Ko Ho Yi, a good friend whom I've known for about 20 years. We used to attend uh, APEC finance ministers uh, uh, conferences together. Uh, Hoi is the chief economist at the ASEAN Plus Three Macroeconomic Research Office, also known as AMRO. He oversees AMRO's work on macroeconomic and financial market surveillance of its member economies, which would be the 10 ASEAN economies, plus uh, China, including Hong Kong, uh, Japan, and South Korea. So over to you, uh, Hoi. Uh, thank you, Donald. Uh... Let me put on my slide. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, my presentation will be focused more on the uh, uh, the policy angle because we are basically a surveillance organization. And this is uh, actually taken from the chapter two or thematic chapter of our flagship report, uh, which we produce once a year. Uh, the first part of the flagship report normally deals with a short-term outlook and the second part deals with uh, structural challenges to the region and especially the long-term growth prospect. You know? So uh, we've been actually concerned about the uh, the growth strategy of the region uh, over the last, uh, you know, uh, last 20-30 uh, years uh, and we have basically uh, Characterize the uh, let me move on to this one. Yeah, characterize the uh, the growth strategy as uh, manufacturing for exports. Uh, uh, this is uh, a basically involved inviting FDI to come to the country uh, and produce cheaper manufacturing goods for export back to the advanced economy. Right, and that strategy has worked relatively well for the region uh, over the past uh, five decades. It has allowed the in the region to industrialize uh, and got richer. But more recently, there's been some concern about, you know, protectionism and also the impact of uh, technology on this strategy. So we decided in this uh, latest uh, report to take a closer look at the, these two uh, uh, global trends 
and see how it affects the, the growth strategy and how the strategy has evolved over time. So let me, okay. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, we are worried about the, the protectionism uh, and, the, in that, and the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, but technology more broadly on the growth strategy. And of course, uh, we are coming out from the COVID-19 pandemic. So, you know, looking ahead in the short term, it's going very bumpy. But they are also concerned about how it affects the longer term prospect of the region, whether it's going to uh, reduce the you know, potential growth. Uh, and so let me move on to this one here. Uh, this is a graphic representation of the growth strategy of the region it's in a flying geese model. Uh, it's basically a, a simple model based on the hash lean, leveraging on a competitive advantage. So in the case of the region, most of them started off as poor developing countries. You know, they leverage on the uh, labor costs, cheap labor, and they industrialize. And, and, and over time, they move up the value chain. So the first uh, group of countries to follow this was the so-called NIE. Japan, of course, being the first one uh, coming out of the war in the 50s. And then the group of NIE countries, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Korea. And that was in between in the 70s and 80s, followed by the ASEAN Tigers, uh, Asian ASEAN Tigers, Thai, Malaysia, Singapore, um, Thailand, Philippines, and Indonesia in the 80s and 90s. And, of course, and then China. And, and finally, uh, we have the group of CLMB countries that started in the, in the 90s and 2000. And over time, they have grown, uh, you know, industrialized uh, and moved up the value chain. So this chart here shows the structural change in the economy over time. Uh, this is the group of CLMB countries, middle income countries, and advanced economy. So you can see that you know, the red bar are the agriculture sector. So over time, the, the agriculture sector uh, is reduced within the country, right, uh, as they industrialize. But also over time, uh, you know, across time as they become deep, uh, middle income and advanced economy. So you can see that for the advanced economy, the agriculture sector is really small. And most of the value added is coming from manufacturing and services sector. Similarly, on the labor market, uh, you can see the structural changes, uh, you know, the, the labor employment and agriculture decline over time. And this is part of the reason why, you know, the uh, increase in productivity is a structural shift from agriculture into manufacturing and services sector. And so it shows a similar trend over time. You know? And in a more advanced economy, you see that the share of agriculture, employment of, uh, of uh, labor in agriculture is really small. But this uh, strategy has uh, come under some uh, 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 scrutiny recently because uh, over time, as I said, uh, technology has made, uh, and there's concern that technology has become, made the manufacturing sector highly automated. And um, more and more capital intensive and less and less labor intensive. And it's, it's a traditional role in terms of generating employment is becoming less and less effective. But I think what most people don't uh, 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 miss out is that the technology is also an enabler of services. And what has happened is that the technology has led to the fragmentation of the production process. And as a result, services has actually emerged as an industry on their own. So if you look at this uh, auto automotive uh, value chain, right, the, a lot of the, 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 the input is uh, in terms of services, uh, from pre-production stage to the factory stage to the you know, post-factory delivery and then finally. So over time, the manufacturing uh, part of the uh, value chain has become smaller and smaller. And this is what uh, I think uh, Edwin pointed out earlier, that you know, China for instance, contributes only 4% of the value add of <laughs> the total export of China uh, to, to the Apple. Uh, whereas uh, much of the value add is now coming from services. Uh, and services, as you know, is relatively labor intensive and that's where the, the generation of employment takes place. Uh, so in the case of Thailand uh, automotive sector, you can see that its export of services uh, has become quite uh, uh, important uh, and, it, and it's a regional hub for export of automotive value, that, uh, services to the region. Uh, similarly for China, uh, this is uh, 
export of uh, China services uh, back in 2000, it was a small little dot here, but uh, in 2018, it has emerged to become a relatively large uh, services hub. And it has actually grown faster than manufacturing uh, over time. Um, so services has emerged as another driver of growth uh, for and you know and value in that region. Uh, so our view was that you know it's not just manufacturing. You got to augment the, the strategy now with services. Another concern that I just highlighted is the protectionism. You know. There has been a view that the 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 globe, the, the world is deglobalizing, and this is a very uh, I think commonly cited uh, chart huh, that tr global trade has stagnated uh, as a percent of GDP, and if you look at some of the indicators, indeed uh, they have uh, come down. Uh, immigrate Im international migrant stock, uh, world trade capital flows, and the only one that has increased is harmful trade intervention, right? So, you know, there is some uh, validity to the, uh, you know, view that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, there's, there's a rise of protectionism, anti-globalization uh, over time. And of course, this has been, you know, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, because of the disruption to the supply chain. You know? And, you know, so the protectionist sentiment has become even stronger. Uh, and there's a view that perhaps the country should not onshore production rather than you know uh, depend on the global value chain, which can, is quite vulnerable to disruption. <clears throat> so we we decided to take a look at the uh, the the share of contribution of uh, external demand to to growth you know, uh, GDP over time. This is a a chart of the contribution of of demand. Or expenditure to growth uh, from 2006 to 2018. If you remember, we have the Great Recession or the global financial crisis back in 2009, and the share of uh, external demand or contribution is is in the grey bar, and it turned negative in 2009 uh, <clears throat> for the region as a whole. The ASEAN plus four, China and Vietnam, uh, and following that. Uh, uh, year, uh, there was a rebalancing of growth uh, where basically countries pump up domestic demand in order to support the economy. So as a result, uh, in, 20, in 2010, uh, the contribution external demand in, improved, but over time it has declined. Uh, so progressively, the contribution external demand has actually gone down. Uh, and you can see that more clearly here, where the share of external demand to, you know, in, in terms of GDP growth, has gone from 27% to 19%, so an eight percentage point decline, which is very, uh, very big. Uh, so the export, uh, manufacturing for export, the export side of it has indeed uh, become uh, less effective, uh, and there's been a rebalancing of growth towards domestic demand. Uh, if this chart shows the uh, the consumption of manufacturing export uh, by the region, the, the red bar, and you can see the consumption has increased over time uh, and the share of export has declined, right? Uh, or external demand. And if you look at the, this is the, this, this bar here, the blue bar, but, but uh, divided into a uh, destination, uh, the share of intra-regional demand has actually increased from 35% to 40%. So domestic demand and intra-regional demand is now becoming a major driver of growth for, for the region. <clears throat> And the reason for that is uh, simple. Uh, the region has industrialized you know, over time and it's gone richer. This is a chart showing the per capita income of the region. And it has, as you can see, many of them started poor and now has become relatively rich. These are for the high income economy, income ranging between 30,000 and 60,000 for the middle income between 4,000 to 10,000. And then even for the CLNB countries, uh, they have basically moved from poor to low middle income economies. <clears throat> uh, so going forward, we, you know, uh, the region is going to, has become a, a, a major consumer market uh, for the product, of its, for its own product. Uh, this is a chart by McKinsey uh, projecting uh, 
increase share of urban consumption uh, over the next uh, 10 years. And you can see that ASEAN plus three will account for 42% of the growth uh, compared to the other uh, region, even the US and Canada. And in terms of luxury product, we all know that China is number one. Uh, it's going to be the, the biggest uh, market for luxury products in the world. And, and tourism is interesting because it, uh, tourism uh, is, is a sector which is basically uh, for the affluent, uh, the middle class, right? And you can see that this is the contribution of ASEAN plus three to tourist arrival. And it is the, <clears throat> the one that is really propelling the tourism industry in, in the region. <clears throat> so now you have a, a conference of two forces. One is the rise of the emergence of the affluent middle class and it's still growing rapidly, right? And that has become a major driver for growth. Uh, and so that reduced dependence on the, on the more advanced economy for, for demand. <clears throat> Uh, so this, this chart shows the uh, the impact of technology on on the uh, economy uh, because of the pandemic. Of course, they accelerated the process of uh, e-commerce and logistics is a very important part of the e-commerce sector. And it turns out logistics is relatively manual at the moment and still has a lot of scope for automation and leveraging on the IoT. You know, Internet of Things and other technology. Uh, so this basically sums up the, the shift in the growth paradigm from uh, traditional to, to the more modern. Traditionally, I guess uh, the manufacturing exports have captured the, the, the growth model pretty well. Uh, they basically produce low uh, manufacturing goods for export to advanced economies, especially the US and, and, and Europe. Uh, going forward, um, you know, they're de more dependent on on regional demand and domestic demand. And also in terms of the goods that's been produced, uh, it's now much more dependent uh, because of the new technologies, but much more customized, uh, experiential type of products, you know. So it's a lot more innovation uh, and and so the dependent is much more on the competitive advantage where you need to build a certain niche in the industry and use that to drive your, your growth. Uh, and in a, in a traditional uh, growth model, you start from low uh, labor intensive product and you move up the, up the ladder. In the new model, uh, you can get fit into the value chain from anywhere. So for instance, uh, you know, a good example would be uh, all the apps that you find on the, you know, on the, on the Androids, right? Uh, if you are smart, you can, you know, come up with some game, uh, or you come up with some kind of a uh, application that is useful, and and immediately, you, you know, you go, you, you leap into the uh, value chain. <clears throat> so let me sum up. Uh, I, you know, I, I, the, so going forward, uh, you know, the environment is very challenging because of COVID nineteen. And everybody is talking about new normal and how, and it could be so. It's going to be uh, much different from the old normal. And the challenge is whether the countries in the region will be able to transition from the traditional to the new. Uh, the other challenge is protectionism. You know, the trade war between China and the U.S. Mm -hmm. is uh, doesn't seem to be subsiding. If anything, is getting worse. And disruptive technology. Uh, technology is an enabler, but it's also very disruptive for the traditional uh, uh, industry. So e-commerce, for instance, has disrupted the traditional uh, shopping. You know? uh, and the GVC will definitely be configured because of these uh, forces, protectionism. There'll be more onshoring, reshoring. You know? uh, and at the same time, uh, digital technology will affect the, the global value chain. Uh, so, you know, e-commerce is a very good example. Right sharing is another example, right? Uh, but, you know, our view is that the, the region as a whole will do well uh, because they've become highly competitive as, as a region because of the, of the highly uh, integrated uh, regional supply chain. And also on the, on the, on the income side, a, rep, a rapidly growing middle class, right? So despite the protectionism, the region has sufficient uh, uh, momentum to be able to grow on its own. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think the region, you know, even while it becomes more integrated, uh, is committed to, to, to be, 
plugged into the rules-based multilateral trade system and can take advantage of the broader uh, global economy uh, in order to grow the, the, the economy themselves. Um, so let me stop here. Uh, be happy to uh, take questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hoi. That was uh, a very, I thought it was very uh, uh, useful and, and interesting overview of uh, some of the trends affecting the region. Uh, the question I'll leave for you on the table right now is how does what, how does what you said square with the risks of uh, premature deindustrialization. Uh, you did mention that countries in the region, particularly uh, not just China, but also countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, to some extent Vietnam, uh, might become less dependent on export-led manufacturing. That services might you know, start to play a bigger role, uh, both for their growth strategy as well as for their role in uh, global value chains. Uh, but there's also the other view that, you know, the reason that these countries are becoming less dependent on export-led growth is that they have not really upgraded their production capabilities, that, uh, that they are de-industrializing at relatively low levels of GDP per capita, that they're losing industrial competitiveness, uh, in the, especially in the face of you know, protectionist sentiment, the, the, the risk of reshoring, and the shortening of global supply chain. So I wanted to just ask, tap your views on how you think uh, you know, the, the rosy picture, somewhat optimistic picture that you painted for the region, how does that square with the fear of premature deindustrialization that others speak about? Uh, so, okay, our, our uh, final panelist, our third speaker, but certainly not least, uh, is uh, Nelson Chow, who's a partner of Supply Chain and Operations Consulting uh, at EUI. He also leads EUI's Greater China Pro Procurement Consulting uh, 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 program, as well as EY China South uh, supply chain consulting practices. So over to you, Nelson. Uh, please Thank unmute you. yourself. Great. Thank you, Donald. So let me share my screen real quick. Um, can you see that? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So uh, my topic today is managing supply chain under the new normal. So I will take around 15 minutes uh, to go through the slides and then uh, we could have a uh, fruitful discussion. So uh, a very brief uh, introduction of myself. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, Donald has already mentioned. I, I work for UI uh, and I'm a partner, uh, basically uh, responsible for the China South and the um, China South Supply Chain Consulting, as well as the Greater China Procurement. Uh, in Hong Kong, I have a public service on uh, as a council member for the Institute for Supply Management, Hong Kong. Uh, I also teach uh, as a visiting lecturer in, uh, in some university in Hong Kong as well. But my day job is really helping clients to do uh, digital transformation um, and by doing that, uh, improving uh, the operational excellence as well as uh, drive margin improvement. So uh, today I would like to uh, divide the uh, topic into three, uh, three buckets. Uh, first uh, is to look at the past um, uh, about how the traditional linear way of supply chain may not work. Uh, and secondly, I will talk about the now, uh, which is uh, which is the uh, response to the global supply chain disruption. Uh, and last but not least, I will uh, just uh, give you a preview of how the future would look like and challenge uh, everyone uh, in this call to think about uh, the future-proof uh, supply chain model. So maybe uh, without further ado, let's uh, drill down in the, uh, the current, uh, sorry, the past situation uh, about the traditional uh, supply chain framework. So if you look at the uh, global context, why uh, a lot of industries or companies are not reacting so, uh, so well with the COVID-19, because the traditional supply chain are uh, based on a certain area, right? If you look at the right-hand side uh, of, the, uh, of the chart, you can see if you are a CFO, right, uh, of your company, let's say for a manufacturer, what do you do, right? You go for cost optimization. I would like to lower my cost so that I could get uh, as much profit uh, as I can, right? If you are a uh, supply chain director, um, then you go for a lean, meaning that uh, I will go for just in time. I will go for uh, reducing waste, right? If you are a procurement, uh, uh, chief procurement officer, then you try to consolidate your suppliers uh, as much as you can and go for uh, you know, global sourcing, right? 
so that uh, your tier one suppliers will have a, the larger share and then you can get a good uh, cut of discount from them. Uh, and traditionally, without too much disruption, uh, the supply chain is quite static. Um, you probably do not need to worry too much, right? Because the demand signal uh, and the supply signal is quite, quite standard. Uh, you could use the historical pattern to project what this year or next year would look like, right? Uh, with some of the uh, variation on marketing and sales. Um, but if you look at this backdrop, uh, that means that we are highly uh, have geographic concentration. We also have a lot of vendor concentration we probably will have a low level of safety stock. The supply chain will be less flexible. If you have not spent uh, much money on technology, uh, like the IoT or a fancy ERP uh, or manufacturing system, your data may not be visualized. And maybe you are working with your uh, internal control or risk team, but uh, those contingency plans may be more on paper. It may not be practical and you may not be able to respond to a crisis no. So I also saw a uh, question uh, from the uh, audience saying that, okay, with that, so what sector will be more impacted and what are not? So if you uh, look at this sector chart uh, on the bottom, of course, travel and tourism, uh, like airline, right, hotels, definitely will be impacted mostly. And of course, um, some of the luxury uh, kind of uh, brand, right, uh, like retail, uh, who is going to buy a luxury good, uh, a fancy handbag uh, without a, a chance to go to work, right? So those are the industry that will be impacted mostly. On the contrary, uh, if you look at those uh, pharmaceutical company or those essential, uh, uh, you know, food product, right? those will be uh, highly uh, profitable. Even if you look at Hong Kong, uh, go to parking shop or, you know, welcome. I think they are not uh, reducing any sales revenue, right? But in fact, they are gaining a lot as well. Uh, but also there are other um, pieces that will uh, gain in this uh, COVID world, uh, which is like telecom, because everyone stuck at home, right? And play with the internet or go to watch Netflix, right? So online, uh, online delivery, Deliveroo, uh, those kind of stuff are actually um, have a positive impact. But uh, just to illustrate to you uh, how complicated uh, a um, supply chain could be, um, I think uh, uh, Professor Edwin uh, mentioned about iPhone, but this may not be iPhone, but can be uh, other other phones, right? If you just break down this little uh, handset, right, the components are more than you know. I uh, apologize. Uh, the components are more than. Uh, maybe hundreds, right, if not thousand, and they are manufacturing uh, in different location. Of course, uh, a lot will be in mainland China, but there will be some in South, South Korea, some in Taiwan, some in Japan, and so on. So if you could imagine, if you have a breakdown of one critical uh, component, then I think your production of this uh, iPhone or Huawei phone will be disrupted. So not to mention the uh, current challenge uh, with the backdrop of Huawei, uh, if you cannot provide the chip right for your mobile phone or any of your equipment, then the critical component will be will be uh, will be the bottleneck, right? So, but just to illustrate how difficult uh, it can be, um, I'm not using the chip, but I'm using the um, the LED uh, monitor screen, right? So, the phone, uh, most of these uh, phone screen will be. Uh, kind of R&D and, and may be produced in South Korea. If you go back in times, right, uh, back to 2020 uh, in March, right? So if I just, this is just captured from a public news from, from a Hong Kong newspaper. So it says that uh, actually uh, those factories uh, are producing uh, more than 400,000 pieces per month, right? And it was supplies to 110 million mobile phones. But at that time, because of COVID, uh, the factory uh, in South Korea actually closed down. So the shutdown of the week uh, actually uh, impact uh, 20 million of mobile phone production. If you are the head of Huawei or iPhone, right, or, or whatever, so how would that impact your sales revenue, right? And how does the, the, uh, the other workers, uh, how are you going to deploy it? So again, right, it's just an illustrative example of how complex this global supply chain can be. So let's quickly look at now. So uh, that will be um, talking about some of the new normal, right? So of course, uh, today's topic is about globalization and global supply chain. Um, 
but it is actually not really only about trade. Um, it is also about uh, politics, right? Uh, look at the uh, civil unrest that we have in Hong Kong uh, and also in Europe, right? So what will happen to those production? Um, if you still remember, uh, a few years ago, uh, we have a cyber attack called WannaCry. So if you are being hacked, right, those kind of uh, companies will be seriously impacted. Not to mention uh, natural disasters, uh, financial distress of your supplier, especially um, right now they have not uh, got enough order and then they may run uh, into a uh, you know, cash flow issue. Uh, and of course, uh, right now we also still be having a threat of uh, terrorism, right? So again, uh, just at a bucket of risk, we have to consider that. And how does that uh, impact the supply chain then? So again, uh, there are many uh, areas to look into, but uh, one way to look into is whether you have a supplier shortage. So uh, we talk about, uh, let's say in China, um, uh, you may not get a critical component, right? Uh, because uh, let's say if you are an auto manufacturer in Wuhan, so how can you get a component from Italy? Let's say if you source from Italy, uh, not to mention about the transportation uh, disruption because um, the airline may change their routing and then uh, they don't have the capacity, they don't want to fly. Um, and of course the retail, if you look at the demand side, um, with the lockdown and uh, the less spending desire, who's going to spend uh, so much money, right? So if you still remember the uh, linear supply chain um, diagram that I showed, the demand signal has changed, right? Because your customer no longer buy like before. Uh, and secondly, uh, is the uh, uh, supply signal you will have shortage of logistic uh, and you have a bottleneck of your uh, procurement uh, supplier as well. Not to mention your manufacturing, uh, who is going to go to work, right? Uh, if there's uh, your worker is, uh, is banned to go to work uh, um, because you have to wear masks and do all these productive, sorry, uh, preventive measures, your workforce may cut to half. So if you look at the uh, board members uh, and survey about them, and most of them are, are saying that they're not very well prepared for a crisis event. So, but, but how does that really impact the business, right? We talk about a concept, but these are the, some of the numbers. Again, it's a perfect information. No matter you are a electronic manufacturer uh, or computer maker or automotive maker uh, or retail or hotel, I think um, you will be impacted by different events. Could be a trade, could be a threat, could be an earthquake, could be a wanna cry, cyber attack. So this shows you uh, this is a serious topic for us to consider uh, as the management team of a company. So let's quickly look at the beyond. So uh, we talk about the past. It sounds like we are having some problem. We have to fix it. No, at the now, mm, sounds like we also uh, can survive. Maybe you can bounce back. But again, right, right now we are uh, in a very fast paced uh, world. So the world has changing real quick, right? So what I am trying to say is that uh, if you look at this uh, two dimension, right, uh, on the uh, bottom, you can see the supply chain resiliency, meaning that you have a lot of flexibility, right? But uh, if you are looking at the uh, uh, sort of vertical axis, uh, it's about the risk exposure. So right now, I think uh, in the past, uh, in the yesterday world, sounds like you have a low risk environment and your supply resiliency can be low. But today you are in a very high risk uh, area, but your resiliency or flexibility is also quite low. That means you have a problem uh, to, uh, to uh, expose your uh, production or company uh, revenue, right? Uh, uh, but in the future, if you make the right choice and make the right investment, you could build a uh, resiliency uh, in the supply chain and still maintain a uh, low and medium risk. So uh, again, right, uh, if you uh, follow my thought process, uh, how the old world would look like is because it's quite linear. It sounds like we have a stable customer. Uh, in the middle, I have this manufacturer OEM or supply chain operation. As long as the demand uh, okay, then I build my product, I sell it, and then I source my component from the supplier. But uh, unfortunately, we are not living in this world. We are living in the new world, meaning that uh, it is a complicated uh, globalized uh, network, right? So you may not only source from uh, a set of supply in China, you're sourcing globally. 
maybe your manufacturing is not all owned by you. It's also using some outsourced manufacturing provider like OEM or ODM. And your customer do not buy only from your retail store, but go online. And they also demand for uh, different um, kind of, uh, you know, surface level. So if you look at the um, diagram uh, in the era, if especially when you talk to the young people, so you have to ask yourself a few questions, especially the what if question. In terms of the demand planning, what if the planning can be less manual, but more autonomous, right? Can you leverage uh, IoT technology? Uh, can you leverage uh, a advanced uh, ERP system and a uh, digital, digital dashboard? to monitor all this uh, uh, demand signal. On the supply side, what if your uh, supply chain uh, is actually uh, more uh, towards a risk and uh, protectionism uh, kind of mode, right? Do you still want to concentrate all your supplies to one uh, or two uh, suppliers or you want to diversify the risk? In terms of manufacturing, what if the customers demand more personal products as well as in a faster pace? So if you look at the fashion industry, uh, people are demanding more seasons right, than before. Uh, in the past, you can produce two seasons. Right now, they are talking about fast fashion, and you may you know, buy a cloth and throw it away in, uh, in a year. What if your uh, logistic, right? Uh, if you go online and if you look at China, uh, people would expect you to deliver it directly to their home in two hours. Right? And if they don't like it, they will just return it with a 100% um, return. So how do you manage your logistic network? So again, right, you have to ask yourself a bunch of questions to decide your future supply chain uh, and not to only fix your current pain points. So again, uh, how to do it? Uh, so uh, fortunately, uh, with the technology advancement, there are a lot of things we can do. For example, uh, if you want to have visibility of your demand and supply check signal, you, you can um, have a control tower uh, or what we call a uh, orchestration tower to look at all the data across your manufacturing plant, put it in a dashboard and it is mobile enabled. So you could understand the shipment, the stock, the free status uh, accordingly. And so, so I think uh, there are a lot to explore, uh, but let me show you again, right? How do you manage the risk? Uh, and if you do not manage it properly, and if you don't invest in your system or process or organization, I think it will be quite messy. So this is a case study, uh, not new, but it's an automotive uh, company. Of course, if you look at the diagram above, uh, they have uh, multiple uh, tiers of suppliers. Um, uh, when the earthquake comes on day one, um, they go to the ERP, download their uh, Item master sounds like the impact is not really high, but uh, as time goes by, uh, they find that uh, the component impact is from 25 goes to uh, 1,500. And uh, after a few days, they find that more than 6,000 materials are being impacted, which means that uh, if you do not invest in supply chain visibility uh, or system uh, or data analytics, that means you will be very delayed in your decision and end up uh, with a huge, uh, huge loss in your production cost. But uh, if I can flip to the um, uh, bright side, right? Uh, we also see uh, some of the companies um, in this COVID world have innovated. So how they innovate, uh, this is a case in China. Uh, uh, it's a supermarket. In the past, uh, they use uh, a traditional procurement model where they will uh, use some intermediate to source uh, like the uh, fruit, the fish, the chicken, right? Um, uh, through this uh, middleman, uh, and then they go through uh, this supermarket. But because of the COVID world, uh, they just directly change uh, uh, without this intermediate, um, but work with these uh, direct farmers, right? And uh, producer, but with the support of the government. So the government actually set up a website to link these qualified uh, suppliers uh, uh, and allow the, uh, the, the shoppers right, or the buyer to, to shop online. And they are also doing a lot of, uh, uh, how to say, uh, measures uh, because at that time uh, in Wuhan, if you remember, the road are shut down. Uh, people cannot transfer from one location to other. The government actually uh, pre-qualified the suppliers and do this health check uh, with this uh, uh, these farmers, right? So or the truck driver, so that they could go through the uh, 
the pole, right, or the tunnel uh, in with ease. So again, right, the uh, there's also opportunities uh, there uh, if you you are smart about it. So I just want to quickly wrap up um, with three points. One is uh, disruption is really uh, creating challenge, but also opportunity. Secondly, uh, don't forget about supply uh, supply chain agility as well as resilience. And right now is the time to uh, invest in your uh, new infrastructure. Uh, it's like uh, right now, uh, if you haven't do exercise for a long time, you have a lot of fat, probably, uh, probably you need to cut it but then uh, you also need to build some muscle uh, accordingly. So uh, just want to wrap up with this uh, little phrase, right? Uh, as I mentioned, um, it's time to get control of the current crisis, invest and build more resilient supply chain. Uh, I don't think that the uh, new normal will go away very soon. Um, um, I mean, in terms of the mentality uh, as well, uh, and I mean the you know, human mentality, maybe people already get used to working from home, right? <laughs> and maybe people are expecting uh, more online um, and so on. And we don't know the vaccine when will come out. So again, right, uh, it's time to think uh, border and beyond. So I will leave that um, thought with you uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Nelson, for giving us that uh, firm level uh, perspective. And it's a very valuable perspective. Uh, because the other two speakers have looked most, mostly from a macro view uh, and also for emphasizing the importance of supply chain resilience. So the question I have for you, uh, I'll, I'll leave it on the table first, uh, is do you think there is a necessary trade-off uh, between efficiency, you know, one of the reasons, the main reason supply chains have become so attenuated, right? So extended, so complex in your, in your terminology is because it gives, delivers savings, cost savings, efficiency. Uh, but do you think in the pursuit of that, companies might have lost sight of resilience, and which is your larger point. And, and, but of course, resilience requires, as you say, diversification of sources or of suppliers. Uh, it require, requires some slack and redundancy, and that, that may, it may not be so efficient. So uh, do you think there's a necessary trade-off and, and should companies be thinking of it in a more or how should companies think about this trade-off in a more holistic way? How do we achieve resilience without losing too much uh, efficiency? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so thanks very much again, uh, Nelson, and to all our panelists. I think we had three very good uh, presentations uh, from somewhat slightly different perspective. So we've also got some great questions on the Q&A box. So the first one is to uh, Edwin. Some, uh, Michael Kurt says, uh, are you saying that China is merely evading those tariffs by moving its exports through third party, third economies? Uh, or are you saying that country, these other third countries, third parties are taking advantage uh, of the trade war to take market share, as it were, from China? I suspect it's a combination of both, right? What do you think? Edwin, I mean, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 was, I was going to, to say that it's a combination of both. It's going to be both, I think. Uh, on the one hand, you have other countries like Vietnam or uh, that or Mexico. Uh, they would take advantage of the fact that uh, of, of certain 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 goods uh, just be, uh, from China become uh, they become not 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 non competitive now uh, in the U.S. So so they would steal some business uh, from China. But on the other hand, some there are some uh, very shrewd uh, Chinese business people. Uh, maybe some Hong Kong Chinese, uh, Hong Kong business people, or whatever, or even Malaysian business people, they they would just take advantage of this, and then they would, you know, uh, try to uh, open up their factories in Vietnam or, or Mexico, and and they they had connections with China, right? So, so uh, then then it, it's it's both, it's, it's kind of both, right? So, uh, um, I, I think it, it's that that will be my answer. Yeah. So um, the market works. Basically, it's just the market. The market will just we channel things. When you have the, the the government intervention, in this case, a tariff is a government intervention. You try to try to disrupt the market, and then the market will just just work through its way to the most efficient path. And that will uh, involve, uh, you know, some, you know, very, very uh, smart business people, you know, who, who make some decision. And that involves some Chinese business people or some Mexican or Vietnamese business people. Yeah, basically it's like that. 
Thanks. thanks. While, while, while you're still on, uh, on, on this, uh, and I also open it up to Hoi, what do you think is the future of trade imbalances? Are we likely to see a resumption of very large uh, current account surpluses on the part of China? Because as I said, China services imports have, uh, have, have collapsed, but it's goods surplus, right? It's, 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 it's surplus, it's trade surplus and goods is, 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 is balloon again, right? Um, and if so, will there be international pressure or will we see a resumption of the trade war, right? Greater international pressure on China to, to play a more active role in trying to revive global growth. I also note, for instance, that you know, in the West, the stimulus has mostly been directed at consumers. <coughs> but in China, a lot of the support has been directed to companies. Uh, whereas consumers, to a lesser extent, I think, uh, the Chinese consumers are not you know, consuming as much from the rest of the world, but the rest of the world is consuming a lot. So do you think we'll see, again, an uptick in protectionist sentiment and uptick of uh, you know, the, the accusation that China is pursuing mercantilist policies. And I also ask Hui to, to chip in on this. Edwin? Uh, can I talk now or? Okay, okay so let, let me just uh, be the first one to respond and then I'll leave the other two to, to come in as well. So I can tell you, uh, I, I worry about the resurgence of uh, or, or the, uh, the, the tension uh, the trade tension between not just China with the U.S., but China with other countries will may actually uh, increase uh, uh, after the uh, COVID. The reason why is I look at this data just now. Uh, it's really amazing. From the first quarter of 2020 to the second quarter of 2020, China's exports to the rest of the world, in fact, increases by 30%, 30%, 3-0. The worst of the world, the whole entire world, from the first quarter of 2020 to the second quarter of 2020, the total world's exports adding together falls or fell by 13%, 1-3%. And I, I look at the data, almost no country in the world have their export increase from the first to the second quarter. But China exports by 30%. So I think this actually may actually exacerbate the tension. Uh, and I do worry about it. Uh, China is the, uh, uh, the the large country that that actually rebounds tremendously from the first and second quarter and and so on. Uh, yeah. So, and I I think actually the China's uh, 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 deficit with the U.S. the trade deficit has actually increased from the first to second quarter if you look at the data. So. Yeah, I don't know how to think of, I, I don't know, I, I only think that it's, it's going to be uh, more tension, but what would be the rest, I would, maybe I'll leave other people to, to comment on it. Oh, you, might, you might want to unmute first. <laughs> yeah, so first on the trade surplus issue, uh, I think we are still in transition, right? So it's very hard to uh, read from the one quarter what the, the trend might be going forward. Uh, but uh, if indeed uh, China is rebalancing growth, uh, I don't know what this dual circulation it implies that maybe there'll be more emphasis on domestic sector, domestic demand. Uh, uh, then it's likely that once, you know, the global economy fully recovers, we, we will see, you know, the strict supply shrink again. Because one of the reasons why is, uh, Registering such a large current account surplus also is because its services uh, account has improved a lot because China accounts for a large number of tourism outflow, right? Uh, so it's really a net importer of services, you know, uh, from the rest of the world. So no, which, which has dried up, right? Because of, of pandemic, that, that surplus has dried up. Also, dried up. Deficit, yeah. The services deficit has dried up. Because has dried up. Oh, yeah. Nobody's traveling. Right? Yeah. Nobody's traveling, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there is a pent up demand for travel in China. There are only like nine percent of the citizens have a passport, so you know the the, the scope for uh, travel to tourism is really huge uh, for the region. Which is why I think you know countries in ASEAN can actually benefit from the tourism industry still. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of scope for that. Uh, so I, I think it's a bit too early to tell. But at the end of the day, I think from a macro economist perspective, it's the savings investment. Uh, you know that really drives your uh, uh, your current account and your so i 
you know, the, the, the fixation on the trade deficit is, is very Trumpish. <laughs> I don't know if uh, the average, the mainstream economies don't even look at that very closely. They realize that, you know, uh, somebody has to run a deficit, somebody has to run a surplus, and at the end of the day, you know, the market uh, find a way to balance the, 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 the differences. Um, on, the de on the issue of deindustrialization that you raised earlier, uh, I, I I think it would be uh, wrong to characterize the, the country as deindustrializing. I, th I think there's a difference between deglobalization and deindustrialization, right? Uh, I think that the concern expressed by Danny Roddick and, co and, and company is that because of deindustrialization, now developing countries have lost an opportunity to, you know, and maybe may not be able to industrialize and grow, right? I, I think that is a rather pessimistic uh, view of the, the whole. Uh, Process of development. You know? uh, I think what we 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 we're trying to uh, emphasize is that the the manufacturing space has gotten smaller and smaller. But that's because you know fragmentation and 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 the emergence of services as a, as a, as part of that integral part of the value chain. So you don't need to industrialize in a, in a, in the narrow sense of the word manufacturing in order to, to grow. So you look at Apple. Apple doesn't doesn't manufacture anything, right? It, it only design and and, and market and, and provide service. It totally hollowed out in the, in in a, in the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So if, if for a country to you know, I think that the more important issue is whether the country can keep up with technology, and and actually now increasingly, you don't need to be at the forefront of technology. You need to be creative. You need to be innovative. You need to be able to come up with uh, products. You know that the, the market wants, right? I mean, look at, the, look at Korea. Korea has now developed a huge uh, drama, you know, uh, cultural industry, you know, on Korean drama and, and, and K-pop and all that. And, and that's a very successful industry, right? You are not at the cutting edge of uh, high tech, okay? But it's a different kind of uh, 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 technology. <laughs> yeah. or, or, or look at Indonesia, right? Uh, it's yeah. a low middle income country. So, so I, I think slowly, you know, the, the, the value is going to shift from the traditional high tech uh, to this, this type of uh, skills and services that are in the one in the market, right? And you can always buy technology, you know, um, and, and that's, the, that's the beauty of the global value chain. You don't have to produce everything yourself. You can buy it, right? And you, you look at GoPro, GoPro, the camera, the guy just came up with the idea and then went to Shenzhen and they, they, they made it for him, right? I mean. And most of the value add is in the, in the design, in the marketing. <laughs> the value in the manufacturing is actually quite small, right? And because it's become so complex, as uh, Nelson pointed out, actually, I, I think it's just not possible to, you know, to, to pull back and try to produce everything yourself, you know? And you need to diversify and find more diversify your sources of supply to make sure that if one breaks down, you have an alternative, right? Because you know, this kind of uh, natural disasters or, or shocks can come anytime, anywhere and hit not anybody. So the best way to build resilience is to diversify and build inventory of your critical uh, 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 material or supplies, right? Yeah. It's a good time for me to uh, turn to Nelson, uh, uh, who, who I think talked a lot about the fragmentation, what Nelson calls the complexity of the supply chain. What, what do you think would be the prospects going forward for developing countries? Uh, obviously, in, in, in places like Shenzhen, you know, the Pearl River Delta, that, as Hoi says, they've benefited hugely from upgrading their capabilities, from plugging into global supply chains. You know, uh, uh, but as, as Hoi was describing, do you, do you think that the, post, the, the window for developing countries might shrink? They are shrinking, they might be shrinking in manufacturing, but as Hoi also mentioned, uh, the opportunities are actually growing in services and creative industries. Uh, what's your sense of it, Nelson, when you uh, in, in, in the industries you have worked in or you have worked with? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Tondo, for the question. Um, maybe my my answer is less on the macro uh, economic yeah. uh, angle, um, but I'm just uh, like in Shenzhen, right? They are positioned as a high tech company. Look at uh, Tencent. Look at Huawei, right? Those companies are based there. Uh, if you look at the medical equipment, uh, 
like MyRay, um, is one of the uh, largest medical Chinese uh, manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So I think they are focusing more on those kind of uh, investment uh, in the uh, technology. So um, I'm not sure uh, they do not have too much um, kind of traditional manufacturing. Uh, if you look back 10, 20 years ago, if you go to Dongguan, you go to Weizhou, right, uh, the Greater Bay Area, or Zhongshan, you, you, you still have like the shoes manufacturing, right? I'm not sure, very sure, uh, or the garment, right? So I think uh, in the past two, three years, even without the COVID, um, they are thinking to moving out the garment to these uh, emerging markets. Um, so maybe, uh, although the, uh, the trend is go to the surface as, um, as uh, Ho Yi mentioned, but I think in, in practice, there are still people interested to do certain of business, right? And maybe if, if a, you know, more emerging market, they will pick it up and they can still earn money, right? So that is my angle. It's just a division of labor. I always think from, from a uh, angle that why globalization will still, uh, still stays because it's just specialization of skills, right? You have the right people to do the right thing. <laughs> so why are you going to another people to do something that they are not specialized? It just doesn't make sense. So that is my view of, uh, I think the de globalization is still happening um, because of this trade war uh, politics and so on. But if you look at the longer term, I, I don't think people were just able to do everything mm. in, this, in their own country, right? With, yeah. with, uh, with isolation. Mm, yeah, that, so, so you share Hoi's uh, optimism of the longer term prospects uh, of, of for globalization. And even when these uh, lower value added activities like garments, uh, you know, assembly of electronics, even when they move to move out of, uh, say, the Pearl River Delta, they actually benefit right, countries further up. And this is Hoi's essence of the, mm. of the flying geese. Uh, they also benefit countries like uh, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Bangladesh. Right, when they take on these. But we have another question on the Q&A uh, box, which says uh, China is committed to carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, how, how will Factory Asia, how will this affect Factory Asia value chains? Will we see China pushing out its polluting activities to countries further down the value chain? Or, or, or as Nelson suggests, this is, uh, is, this is going to happen anyway, as, as you know, the, the, the logic, the, the gravity that, that comparative advantage uh, exercises, right, uh, will, will make this happen quite naturally. What do you all think? Maybe we start with uh, Edwin or Hui. Yeah, uh, so I, I think it's a very good point uh, that uh, China now have committed to, uh, to be carbon neutral by 2060, right? I, I think that's what it said. Uh, so, so it had to start now, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, it is very likely that China is going to move the more polluting uh, segment of the production uh, to to um, out of China. I, I think this is a very, very plausible uh, scenario. Uh, not it's it's um, also for its own good, actually, for its own good. I mean, the the pollution pollution has always been a problem uh, in in Chinese cities. Um, so, uh, what will be the implication on global value chain? Um, I guess this very often the more polluting uh, part of the uh, of the of production process is also more downstream, oftentimes. Uh, and it is you can see that uh, China is, uh, seems to be kind of moving the low, the more downstream part of the of the value of the global value chain uh, overseas uh, the, the downstream one is usually more labor intensive or more environmental in, intensive in the sense uh, polluting pollution intensive uh, so that kind of seems to uh, to be consistent with, with the China's uh, national policy I think uh, so China would be moving up the chain so to speak uh, I think uh, uh, in the, as, a, as a general direction, uh, and also one has to understand that, that we also want to emphasize more service, right? So, so uh, manufacturing will play a lesser role, smaller role as well. Um, so, um, I think that that is that that would be my view of, of that. Yeah. 
Uh, right. Why don't I get Albert, uh, who's, who's yes. the, yeah, to, to, to chip in with a question, then we can take it all together. Albert, go ahead. Uh, thanks. I'm a development economist here at HKOT. And I just wanted to point out that there's a, a pretty strong disagreement between Edwin's view and Hoye's view in the sense that Edwin is saying the global value chains are important for developing countries to get into manufacturing and that that's key to their long-term growth. And Hoey is kind of saying the global value chain kind of opens opportunities. We can get into the value chain in any part of the value chain. And so it's not so important that you do manufacturing. And those are really quite different perspectives on kind of development strategy and where productivity comes from. And I, and I, I don't think it's obvious which of these views is, is completely correct, but I, I want to kind of side a little bit with Edwin's argument in the sense that Number one, is there any country of any size historically that has skipped the manufacturing stage at, in, on its path to high levels of GDP per capita? Maybe there are, but I'm not, I'm not sure. And then also it really depends on how you think productivity is achieved because um, what, what's great about global value chains is that the poorest countries, well, one thing I want to say is that comparative advantage still dictates where people enter the global value chain for the most part. Although, you know, specific capabilities could enter at higher levels. So poorer countries with cheap labor are going to enter the value chain at the lowest level, like China did initially. It's going to be assembly intensive. And for China, that really raised employment, created incomes, and was incredibly important for a lot of learning processes through FDI and capacity building. And then China moved up the value chain or occupied an increasingly large share of the value chain. And that was really important in a dynamic view of how learning occurs and productivity growth occurs. So I'm not so sure you can skip that step. If, if, uh, if, if, the, if, if there's de-globalization and there aren't as many opportunities for especially the lower income countries to enter global ch value chains in a very specialized way, then it really will just slow down this process. So in that sense, I think Edwin's concerns are valid. So I, I, I don't know if anyone wants to react to any of those perspectives. Thanks. No, I, I tend to agree with you that the uh, industrializations still provide an entree, you know, uh, for more developing countries like Myanmar, Laos, and uh, Cambodia. Uh, but if you look at, uh, say, Cambodia, right? I mean, it's very, you know, it has a, <clears throat> a very large uh, garment industry. Huh? And and even within the garment industry, uh, already, you know, they see that they need to automate uh, and because of uh, technology, that even that is going to become less and less labor intensive over time, right? And the alternative, so they need to move up the, the value chain uh, to more sort of uh, uh, high value garment, right? Uh, fashion style garment. But there are limits to how, how, how much you can push that envelope, you know? Then you need to start like, diversifying into other like consumer uh, uh, toys and all that uh, other products. And, and so that's a, that's a space where if you are a poor country with a, a, you know, labor, I think it's an easy space to get in and, and build up uh, uh, skills and capacity. But once you get to the, to the middle income, right, uh, you can continue trying to, 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 to push, em the, push the envelope and try to move up the value chain as Malaysia, you know, uh, Thailand tries to do for automotive and, and other industries. Uh, but will you be able to get to the point of producing your own car or your own? <laughs> that is not... Uh, going to be that straightforward, right? So at some point, I, I, and also it's becoming less and less labor intensive, then what do you do in order to create jobs for your, for your people? And that's where I think, you know, you need to also think about the services industry. And Cambodia is actually doing a lot of that. Cambodia is a very large service industry. That's why it's been hit quite badly by this uh, pandemic. Huh? Uh, on, 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 on the, on, and I, I think there's some merit to what Edwin said about uh, outsourcing your carbon polluting industry, but I, I don't think that's the in, in, <laughs> intention of China. Uh, I think the, the, the really the, the hope is that we'll come up with green energy, right, uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, carbon-based form of energy. And technology is moving so rapidly that in 40 years from now, you know, if we are not able to achieve uh, 
a more efficient, a more green type of energy, uh, I think we'll be in big, deep trouble. Especially with uh, the world population, you know, expected to grow from 7.5 billion now to in 2060, it will be, you know, 9, 10 billion. I mean, it's a huge uh, increase in population. We need to find some way to, uh, to, to cut down the, the, the emission. And it, I, and it can be done, I think, if, if uh, you know, if the world comes together and, and put their mind to it. But uh, I mean, if, if any country can, can, can do this, I think China has a very good chance of uh, at least through its own, own uh, initiative, you know, bringing other countries on board. Uh, I think European countries are extremely concerned about this issue. It's only in the US and even in the US, it's only Trump. <laughs> I mean, most of the other kind of, most of the other politicians are also very concerned about this, especially the forest fire raising in California, Oregon, and all these other, other places. So we are really, I think, at a tipping point, and, and it's really uh, important that China you know, send this initiative, uh, signal that it's serious about this. Of course, it's partly political as well, uh, but it's taking a le leadership in the climate change. Now, on, on, on Albert's question of uh, prospects of industrialization for developing countries, I think a lot also depends on what China does, right? If China fights to keep on to its lower cost, lower value industries, then that it can really, you know, choke up that 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 flying geese that uh, model that Koyi was talking about, where you know as countries move up the value chain, the lower cost manufacturing activities can can you know move over to less developed countries. But if China actually goes back to its original intent of saying let's try to boost domestic consumption right let's look for more sustainable sources of uh, growth and actually encourage or allows its firms to you know to move to neighboring countries in the region that you know industrialization that still remains very much an open highway for poor countries to catch up so i would like to tap on nelson's views then i mean what's what's been your experience i mean you, you are very familiar with chinese operation mm. big chinese companies in 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 the pearl river delta ha has the tendency been for them to move <coughs> other parts of china or has it been more to move to Cambodia, to, to Thailand, to Bangladesh? What, what's yeah. your experience being? Yeah. Don't, don't know if I may, I just want to uh, just chime in on the uh, carbon neutral right. uh, question, and then I probably can answer this question. So I think, um, first of all, I think in this uh, global context of global, uh, sorry, COVID-19, right? People started to work from home. Uh, factory got shut down, people kind of have an expectation and they like the fresh air, right? So, so people just have this ambition and they, they feel like they want something. And this talk about uh, the stakeholders, uh, of course, the global citizen, the group cannot tolerate any more pollution, right? Otherwise, our next generation and the uh, next generation will, will distinct, right? <laughs> not, not to scare people, but uh, just reality. And if you look at the macro level of other stakeholders, um, you took, talk, we talk about the uh, Chinese uh, is getting more affluent, right? The middle class, they also expect a better lifestyle. If you go to Beijing or go to whatever, you still have to wear masks, right? Uh, because of this uh, air pollution, I don't think it is sustainable. And if you look at other stakeholders like financial institution, um, they are responsible for investment. And they are also saying that if you are uh, not sustainable or not green, they will stop investing, right? So I, again, there are so many drivers for China to do it. Uh, and if you look at China as a country, if they decided to do it, they probably can do it right? <laughs> or get it done, or at least they will achieve 80% of their goal. So uh, with, you know, tax, you know, you know or, or uh, um, incentive and so on, right? So I think that is why they, they are doing it. Uh, and I happen to be uh, the global client service partner for, uh, for a power and utilities company. Uh, if you look at the CO2 emission, of course, uh, the, uh, one of the major sources is coal plant uh, electricity generation. Uh, so I think China has the ability to go for renewables, right? No matter your solar uh, or you know gas or wind or whatever, right? So they have the uh, ability if they want to cut down that that thing, uh, the the coal plant, right? Uh, and of course, if you look at the um, consum consumption side, right? Uh, where are the pollutants coming from? Is the factory? 
uh, is the car, right, on the road, um, and so on, right? So on the car itself, there are the electric vehicle, right? If you look at the China, of course, in US, you have Tesla, but in China, they also have BYD, they have uh, Xiaopeng, they have, you know, uh, uh, Neo, right, or whatever. So, so I think in, in the transportation, all electrified. So uh, the question is, uh, is whether they can do it or is they, did they have the technology to do it? Mm, I would say more towards the yes, right? So, and they are more um, kind of say, if you set a North Star goal, then they will go for it. Uh, but if it is Europe or US, they may have to, a lot of consultation, right? And takes years to, to get it done. So uh, that is my, my humble view of what uh, I see in, in the market. Mm. That's great. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll end with uh, Edwin. Uh, final thoughts on prospects for developing countries and is, is manufacturing and export-led manual industrialization still the, 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 the primary strategy for developing countries to develop? Yes, my answer is yes. Uh, I was just want to follow up a little bit with uh, Albert's uh, comment. Uh, uh, I, I agree with him that uh, industrialization really uh, seems to be a uh, uh, the uh, inevitable path uh, for uh, uh, for poor country to uh, to develop, which is uh, industrialization. And the reason why industrialization is uh, uh, inevitable is uh, is important is because uh, trade is very closely tied to development. You need to trade. You need to export your goods, and and manufactured goods are much more tradable than service. I mean, you can have uh, some some exam uh, some exception like uh, India. You know, you you have Bank Bangalore uh, exporting uh, this uh, call service, back office uh, call service uh, kind of thing. But but that's more exceptional than the rule. So the most of the uh, things that are tradable are actually manufactured goods, and trade is closely tied to development. So without trade, you cannot uh, have development. The reason is because uh, usually developing country had the large rural labor, labor surplus, and you have to absorb the, that uh, large rural labor surplus uh, through this uh, uh, kind of Lewis uh, kind of uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, and manufacturing in the in an urban area is, is going to absorb this rural labor surplus uh, to to get this uh, uh, labor uh, uh, underemployed uh, uh, labor employed and and get. Uh, uh, development and growth. So, uh, and th for that reason, I, I look at the experience of China, uh, that uh, manufacturing export uh, just skyrocketed uh, starting from 1980, which is, is basically an evidence to show that, you know, uh, um, uh, plugging into the global value chain is a very important uh, uh, strategy of China uh, in, in uh, industrialization. And and therefore, uh, the recent uh, sentiment, uh, protectionist sentiment uh, expressed by the developed countries uh, worries me uh, because that means that the path to uh, industrialization uh, for a lot of poor countries may be disrupted. Uh, so, so that is my, my, my worry. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I still stand, stand by my point that industrialization is really important and global value chain it provides a very good opportunity for, global, for industrialization. Hmm, thank you very much. I, I think I think that's a good note to end on because I think Ho Yi would agree with that also, that industrialization or at least that globalization has been beneficial for poor countries, that it's been a way for poor countries, global value chains has been a way for developing countries to learn right, through trading, right, learn by plugging into value chains. And so where, where you differ uh, with Ho Yi, I guess, is, is how viable is industrialization? How necessary is it? Uh, still as a strategy for development. You, you are more insistent that, uh, that there's really no other choice. Hoi has a more eclectic view that, you know, maybe services can take part of the, maybe not replace manufacturing entirely, but can complement or at least pick up, pick up for some of the, uh, uh, the role that uh, manufacturing used to play. I think that's a good uh, place to end because really we don't know. Uh, we don't know how global value chains are going to evolve in the future. We don't know how technologies are going to evolve in the future. And, and how essential it is for countries to, uh, how, how possible leapfrogging uh, is for, uh, while we see instances of leapfrogging in particular big countries like Indonesia, uh, it's still not the main story, it's still not the main uh, pathway to rapid uh, development. So I think the future is still very much left for developing countries to create for themselves. Uh, globalization, I, I share Bowie and Nelson and uh, 
uh, Edwin's uh, uh, concerns that that it is you know we are, are undergoing a particularly challenging time for globalization. Uh, but but you know that again it is not a foregone conclusion that we will reverse uh, go, go into reverse on, on, on globalization. That, that you know no reason for excessive pessimism. So on that somewhat hopeful note, I think uh, I'll call this uh, webinar to a close. I'm sure you agree with me that. We had lots to discuss, uh, not just on the pandemic, but also on the prospects for development, on the future of global value chains, and uh, how we can all, uh, you know, work towards, you know, even closer and more, not just more greater integration, right, but also more resilient uh, forms of globalization, more resilient forms of uh, global integration. Uh, on that note, I really want to thank our uh, uh, webinar panelists, uh, Nelson, Hoi, Edwin, as well as Albert for contributing so richly to the discussion. And of course, to you, the participants, uh, for staying with us uh, right to the end uh, on this very interesting topic. Thank you, and uh, uh, good day to everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Glad to meet all of you on the uh, webinar. <laughs> Friday. Bye-bye.